So I, uh, I started out doing a fairly detailed uh, run through of setting up the hard drive and all the different choices you're making in the beginning when you're installing Gen 2. And then someone asked me in the comments, like, if I'm going to record the actual installation, kind of like a step-by-step -step guide. And I thought about it for a bit, and I decided that, no, I'm not going to do that. The reason why is that, first of all, there are already uh, several videos on YouTube doing step-by-step -step installations where they talk about what they're doing. But also because when you install Gen 2, the actual installation is just figuring out what kind of hardware, hardware you have and then copying files over and starting up the system. So the actual installation doesn't really have that many choices in it. And I don't see any reason for me to go over that in any detail. Also, there are very excellent uh, how-tos on the Gen2 wiki. There is the official uh, manual or the, the official uh, handbook. And then there's also the Sakaki guide for uh, FE install, which covers a few different options. So just by reading those two wiki entries and comparing them a bit, you will find out a lot about what you need to do. Uh, and if you're just looking to copy a method that someone else has, then maybe you should just go to a different distribution where someone else is making choices for you. Because the point of installing Gen 2 is that you're not copying someone else. The point of installing Gen 2 is that you know what you want and you're making your own choices uh, in each step of the way. So if you don't know what you want and you just want to install Linux, then go to a different distribution where someone else already made all the choices for you. Uh, is my attitude to the whole thing. So, anyway, that being said, here's a step-by-step -step guide to installing Gen 2. Uh, first, you start Linux, and you can start li any type of Linux. If you have Linux installed from before, if you have a live DVD from a different distribution, like Ubuntu or whatever else, it doesn't matter. Just start Linux. Uh, of course, Gen2 offers a minimum install CD, which you can also run from USB stick. Uh, and there's also the Gen2 Live DVD. But you can use any distribution of Linux. Just start it up. When you start up Linux, you download the Stage 3 Gen2. Uh, you copy the files from that to your hard drive, you change root into your hard drive, and then you compile your new system, and then you reboot, and there's your Gen 2. That's all there is to it. And after that, you need to make a lot of choices about what kind of uh, system you want to run, what type of software you want to put on your system, and that's what I want to cover in my guide. But this installation is super simple. Just follow the wiki and you're going to be fine. So I don't see a, a reason to cover it in any detail. I will mention uh, something else, which is we talked about the hard drive that when you turn on the computer, either the BIOS or the UEFI is going to load up. It's going to start reading your hard drive and load the kernel. After the kernel is loaded, it's going to continue load drivers and start up your system. And to continue that loading of your Linux system, there are two major ways of doing that. 
OpenRC is the default in Gen 2, and systemd is the default in pretty much every other distribution. But there is a reason why OpenRC is the default for Gen 2, because Gen 2 is the distribution where you make all the choices because you want the power to make all the choices. And OpenRC allows you to make all those choices for every application on your system. However, making all those choices can be a bit overwhelming and complicated for some users. So that's why all the other distributions use systemd, because it can be a bit more simple to manage. Because it's centralized, whereas OpenRC is more like a distributed solution, kind of. Um, maybe that's the wrong word to use. But anyway, uh, just to give you an idea of the differences between this is that OpenRC, it just detects when you want to run something and there are some run commands. RC is run commands. that are connected to uh, when you start something in a shell. Uh, and then it's going to run those commands, whereas systemd is run as a daemon in the memory. It has the process ID 1. Uh, so it detects whenever you start something and it keeps track of the kind of options you want for every software. So they do the same kind of thing in different ways. Now, OpenRC also has a daemon at, at process ID 1, which is the system 5 or system V in it. Um, but the management is completely different. OpenRC is completely open. You have open source code. You can edit all the run commands yourself. Everything is open and see-through, whereas systemd uses a lot of binary, which means that it's closed. Uh, and the advantage of that is that, in some cases, it's going to be faster. But OpenRC is still fast. So this is not really a reason to go for systemd, because it's going to be a few milliseconds here or there, but you're not really going to notice that big of a difference. OpenRC is just in it, whereas systemd contains in it, and it contains network and some user management, etc. So systemd is sort of starting to encroach on the, on the operating system territory, which is a common thing with people I don't know why, but it seems like people don't like the Linux kernel, and they keep trying to replace it in different ways. Uh, this way is the Linux way of doing things, building Lego with your computer uh, or with your software. But uh, this is the Windows way of doing it, and because it's a bit more simple, a lot of people favor it. When you run OpenRC, you get text file logs like you would expect, whereas systemd produces binary logs, which can be more difficult to access sometimes. So another reason why a lot of people don't like systemd. And the thing is that systemd, people are more or less trying to force systemd on people because since it's a bit more simple to manage, it leads to less support questions. And less support questions means that you, the people who are trying to support people with problems get more time on to spend on real problems. Whereas here, you get to spend more time solving problems. Uh, but you have a lot more control, and you learn more about your system and how to manage your system. So this is in my opinion, the only good way of doing it. Uh, and this is not so good way of doing it. Hello. OK, I'm come to pick you up. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I will pick you up. Sorry, that's my wife. Um, 
So uh, anyway, where was I? OpenRC is the way to do it if you want full control. And system D is the way to do it if you want ease of use. Uh, but it's going to be a more closed system, which is why it is more easy to use. But it's also more like Windows, which is what the reason why we choose Gen 2 is because we want to get away from the closed Windows environment. So that's why OpenRC is the default for Gen 2. And if you run Gen 2 with System D, then why aren't you running Arch or something else? Is my question. But everyone is free to choose whatever they want. And I'm sure that you have your reasons to choose whatever you want to choose. Uh, I'm just giving you my own opinion. One of the things that you also should select when you install your system is a profile. So you can just pick a general profile or you can pick the desktop profile, which is going to set some use flags for you uh, to prepare software for including some graphical user interface in software and so on. You can also specify that your graphical user interface will be GNOME or KDE or Plasma. Um, and you can specify if you want to use System D as your init script. And this, it mostly impacts use flags, but since it impacts use flags, it's going to also impact uh, some of the things that will be installed with your software. So if you choose something like KDE, you'll get a lot more things to install and compile, which will make compilations lower. Uh, so if you're not going to use that, you shouldn't choose it, of course. Just choose what you know you're going to use. And if you're not sure yet, just pick the most basic one, because you can always change it later. And this is something also I want to mention. Uh, when you follow the wiki and the install guides, sometimes you're going to see them that they select this profile, and then they compile the system. They change something very small, and then they change to a desktop profile, and then compile the system again. So why didn't you just choose this profile to begin with? Well, because if something goes wrong, then they know that the thing that went wrong was in the desktop edition. Uh, so when you follow guides and you see that they do some small steps increment, it's just a good habit to increment things in small steps because you're going to see exactly where things go wrong if they go wrong. And yeah. It's just a way to, to make it easier for you to, to do anything when you install from sources and stuff. And especially if you start changing the sources. So just a small tip to, to uh, don't take too big steps forward. Don't change too much. Because if you change too much at one time, then uh, you might end up breaking something. Or rather, if something breaks, it's going to be a lot more difficult to find out what was it that broke things. Okay. 